So thank you for joining again. Thank you, everyone. Uh, this session is the practice session. Uh, this is uh, would be the, the topic would be the retrospective motion correction toolbox hands-on interactive session by Dr. Daniel Gelichan. Uh, Thanks very much for organizing and the introduction uh, and so on. Yeah, so as, as mentioned, this is uh, supposed to be a, an interactive session. I'll try to establish how interactive we can make it um, as we go along. But obviously I do have some slides as well to give a bit of context to get us going. Um, and so um, in terms of disclosure, um, so I will mainly be talking about this open toolbox and the motion correction technique that I developed myself known as FATMABS. I may also mention that we have equipment from Track Innovations and that there is some research support involved in our connection with Track Innovations, just to make that clear. So um, in the slides, I have a, an introduction to what is motion correction in, in MRI and one approach for motion tracking known as 3D FATMABS, which is the method that um, I developed, but obviously there are other ways of tracking motion. And then what the Retro Moco box uh, software toolbox can offer um, for motion correction and beyond. So hopefully there are some bits of it that you might be able to use in your own research, even if you don't necessarily do uh, have anything to do with motion correction at the moment, we'll see. So in terms of interactivity, um, we can start by asking everybody to use a, a browser if you're at a computer or a mobile device or whatever else um, to go to www.menti.com and put in this code and then hopefully uh, you will then get uh, a couple of questions uh, I guess it'll be on the first question at the moment so can just the tester question is do you have any experience with um, MRI motion correction already and so it's useful just to know uh, where people stand on that. Um, I'm just working out the easiest way for me to get this shared slide. So we'll share. So uh, I actually get so how many. People have we got in the room? 27 in the room, we've got 12 people answered so far. So we're getting a picture. So it's kind of a spread. I suppose that's what we thought it might be. Um, so then I suppose the more important question in terms of um, uh, what we can get the most from this session right now is, is to know, uh, do you have MATLAB available to you? Because um, the uh, this is a toolbox that is um, based in MATLAB. And um, something that I have just discovered is that it will actually work in the online version of MATLAB as well. So um, something that I've been using for some of my uh, undergraduate programming teaching with MATLAB, that there's um, a cloud-based version. And if you have a site license, you probably have a license for that. And so um, this toolbox will, will run there as well. And it, probably run faster if I need to demo anything while running Zoom on my laptop because my laptop isn't that uh, powerful. But we do have some people who are ready to give this a go in, in MATLAB by the looks of things, so that's good to know. So we might try and get you to do that. Um, so I'll go um, back to the slides. In the meantime, if you are a GitHub person, then you um, might want to already just go to uh, if you Google Retro Moco Box, that's the name of the, uh, the software. And um, obviously, I'm not used to switching back and forth with lots of different presentations to uh, show you the, the link again quickly. Uh, let's go. Uh, that one. So uh, if you just download that, put it on your path. Um, well, you don't even need to put it on path, it adds it to your path. So just uh, in there, three demo scripts, but you could do the downloading bit already if we want to get ahead of ourselves. So in terms of background and motion in MRI, um, it's fairly 
obvious, I guess, but if the object moves during the scan, then the image is going to be affected in some way. And this effect is different to motion blur in photography because, um, so uh, can you see my pointer when I move it around like this, by the way? Uh, I don't know on the slide. At the yes. Moment. Yes, okay. Uh, so um, in photography, the, um, the shutter of the camera is obviously open for a certain amount of time. And if an object moves um, while the shutter is open, then we'll get blurring of that moving object. But in, in MRI, we're acquiring data in K-space. And so our shutter is effectively happening in K-space. So it's parts of K-space which would be affected. And so then the way the um, image is um, uh, corrupted will be different to that of photography. And so typically we get this kind, we will get some blurring, but we also get uh, ringing and aliasing and ghosting as typical motion artifacts. And it's probably worth mentioning that I'm talking entirely here about head motion. And to some people, head motion is the simple problem because it's a rigid body, unlike the abdomen and the heart, which are moving in a much more complicated way. But um, although we only have six motion parameters to describe the head pose, the three translations and the three rotations, um, we do have that for every single time point during the uh, duration of the acquisition. So actually, um, it's very, still a very rich parameter space of ways that you could possibly move during a scan. And the timing of that motion relative to where you are in K-space is going to affect the, uh, the quality of the image that you can get. And just to point out that um, the, the kind of motion is also important. So um, here I make the comparison that if we were if we had this simulated object and we moved it in a smooth uh, way, so smooth motion throughout the whole scan, um, then we'll get this blurring. And MRI is actually slightly more robust to this, perhaps depending on what you consider image quality, but um, if this happened in case space, we'd get an effect a bit like this. But critically, um, small, what I'm describing as rough motion, and um, it's difficult to come up with, uh, good terminology for how to describe motion um, patterns that people might do. But essentially, if you're moving the whole time, um, then uh, here, not by a very large magnitude, then in a photograph, obviously, that would be a small amount of blurring, so the fine details get blurred slightly. But in MRI, we're creating mismatches across the whole of our case space then in terms of what the signals represent. And when we put this together, we can get some uh, fairly serious artifacts that we might not want in our image. So how can we correct for this motion? Well, first we need to measure it. And there are two families of ways that we can measure the motion. We can use some additional data from the scan itself. Um, so some kind of MR navigator, be that in K-space like these uh, spherical navigators or in image space like these uh, BNAVs, or we could use some kind of external system. So we could have um, in the de this uh, early demonstration by uh, Maxim Seitzer uh, um, was a, a bite bar which fits to the top of the jaw and then these uh, infrared reflective markers. Um, another system uh, that was demonstrated more recently and is currently really still the um, the gold standard for head motion tracking um, is this moiré pattern marker, um, although not by sticking it to the forehead as in this picture, but by having it also on an upper jaw um, bite bar for rigid attachment to the, the skull. Um, once we have that motion information, there are different ways that we can correct for it. And one is to prospectively update the scanner coordinates during the scan. So, just to follow the movement um, as it happens. And the other is retrospective. So if we have the luxury of a 3D imaging volume, so 2D slice by slice won't work in this way, but if we have a 3D A space, then if we know the full motion information for how the person was moving during that scan, and we can assume that they are a rigid body, then we can actually 
um, attempt to correct the case base um, before we do the Fourier transform. And so that bit there is what the retro MOCA box is essentially all about, is putting tools together so that we can do this retrospective correction of the 3D case base. And uh, the navigators that I was using are, are fat navs, which I'll talk a little bit more about, but just to say that essentially um, there are different reasons why you might end up doing prospective or retrospective. And I was forced to do retrospective purely because of the latency in terms of the reconstruction of the fat navs themselves. And so that's a consideration, perhaps, um, if you're um, thinking about the technicalities of these things. In theory, it can be used prospectively, but it would require more um, uh, efficient coding, essentially, and working with that coding on the scanner versus doing it uh, offline in MATLAB. So how can we correct case space? Well, if we're assuming that we acquired the case space in a series of um, planes, as it were, so we're doing line by line, but we do a plane relatively rapidly, and uh, the whole volume then um, slowly. Um, we can correct for translations that might have happened with the object by a simple multiplication of each of these planes by a phase ramp according to how much that uh, object was um, displaced. But rotations will require rotation of the case based planes. And so that, what that means is that effectively we will have acquired case based planes something like uh, this diagram. So that as the object moved, then effectively we've covered our sample our case space differently. And then uh, we need to interpolate back onto a Cartesian grid before the FFT. And so this is implemented using the non-uniform FFT. And that's taken from uh, Jeffrey Fessler's uh, uh, Michigan Image Reconstruction Toolbox, which is also um, a set of MATLAB tools available online. It does a lot more than just the, the NUFT, but that's all it's used for in the uh, retro mocha box. So um, 3D fat nerves is one way that you might get this motion information. And just to show what a fat image looks like compared to a water image, as you might not be used to imaging the fat in the head, um, but we can make an image uh, like this one by using a, a binomial excitation to um, pick out just the fat frequency. And, um, and we see that the fat is basically localized primarily to a layer just below the, um, the scalp and before the skull. And so um, pretty rigid uh, attachment essentially to the motion of the whole head and therefore the brain. Um, and it has this uh, nice property that um, the image itself is very sparse. So there are only a very small number of voxels in this 3D volume that contain the useful information. And so it lends itself really well to very high acceleration factors. And um, so this was a fully sampled image at uh, 32 seconds for two millimeters isotropic. And this is uh, acquired each frame in uh, just over one second um, with simple four by four wrapper acceleration. So 16 times accelerated. And you can see that the image quality of each frame is actually more than we need at this point to, to get a pretty good registration of the, um, the individual fat naps to each other in order to estimate the, the motion. And so then these are interleaved with other sequences and depending on which sequence you're using, you might already have time available where you can slot that in. So MP rage and MP2 rage are a prime example where there's dead time when you're waiting for the T1 to recover. So you can slot in a fat nerve with basically uh, zero penalty in terms of um, scan time. So uh, this is just showing um, how we can then get the motion parameters and uh, the retro mocha box uses uh, SPM to, to do the co-registration. And um, as a point of interest, um, I did try other software packages for doing that alignment and did find that um, the default parameters in SPM seemed best suited so far to registering fat images. Um, and obviously there aren't any packages necessarily already available that are expecting their volumes to look like this. And so um, 
uh, there may be different reasons why it seemed to perform best, but um, there's still potential for optimization down various avenues if, if we wanted to make this as good as possible. But clearly we've got enough information here from the use of slices through the fat mouse, and this is then a maximum intensity projection just to show the kind of um, information contained in each fat mouse. And then this is demonstration of it working um, in a subject that was scanned with uh, no deliberate motion in um, it's approximately 10 minute scan of this uh, 600 micron isotropic at MP2 range at 7T. And um, uh, it's obviously an example of somebody who moved quite a lot. Not everybody moves like this, but you can see that there wasn't any like, event that happened. It was just that they were drifting during the scan. And we see that quite a lot in compliant subjects that they might drift by a few millimeters. This one by as much perhaps as three millimeters. And so then um, that can make quite a lot of difference when you compare the corrected image. And something that's worth noting is that by doing retrospective correction, you have the original data that you, um, you would have got anyway, plus the comparison of the corrected version on exactly the same data. And so you can really say that, well, if you didn't have it in this case, then the, the poor quality one is the one that you would have. Um, and so we can make that valid claim. And it, in motion correction uh, in general, it, it can be quite a problem to create fair comparisons of uh, with and without correction if you're doing real-time tracking because you don't have um, a, an example of what would have happened if you didn't do it necessarily. So to move on to what the the retro mocha box itself can do. So it's a collection of MATLAB based tools for the entire retrospective motion correction pipeline. And as I said before, the, the main bit of applying the NUFT is performed by the uh, MIRT toolbox. Um, but because it works from the raw data, so you need to get the, the raw case based data for all of your RF channels off of, um, you can't necessarily easily use the built-in vendor reconstruction that get, gets you the DICOMs normally at the scanner because the DICOMs aren't going to be enough. And so we actually need the retro mocha box to do the full handling of the raw data as well. So, uh, and that's where you can download it from. Um, it's been used, um, I was previously in, in uh, at the CIBM in Lausanne before I came uh, here to, to Cardiff and um, it, we were collecting the motion of the fat nut version of MP2 Rage by default on the 7T there and uh, using Yara to easily get the raw data into an archive. And then if somebody wanted the motion corrected version, it would be easy just to uh, press a button essentially and get the, the nifty version of that corrected scan. So there's a full pipeline for Siemens. It has also been used for um, Philips data as well. So the toolbox takes the raw data and um, typically the, because it's based primarily for MP rage or MP2 rage, and um, that will only have 1D grapper acceleration on the Siemens scanner. And so it deals with that and then um, does the Fourier transform with the non-uniform Fourier transform and we get our final volume. Um, in order to do that, we also have to reconstruct all of the fat nabs. And so they're four by four accelerated um, uh, 3D volumes as well. So we have to reconstruct all of those, co-register those, get the coordinate systems aligned and apply those parameters to the NUFT. So all of that, you making use of SPM and the MIP toolbox um, is what the retro mocha box um, is taking care of. And so uh, worth noting that this NUF, um, we have to do one of these per RF coil channel. Um, and depending on the size of the 3D volume, because you, you need to fit that one 3D volume into your RAM essentially to, for, for the NUF to work. So it can have um, high uh, RAM requirements and high CPUs essentially that um, 
if you have more CPUs available, especially in MATLAB, you can easily just distribute the different RF channels to a different CPU to take care of. And so then um, you can uh, speed up the reconstruction considerably um, in a fairly straightforward manner. So um, that's a time breakdown of what it's doing. And a lot of it could be done a lot faster. Um, but approximately a one millimeter scan will take about seven minutes to reconstruct. This is on a, um, I you can probably get away with that on a, um, on a laptop basically nowadays. Um, the 600 micron one takes about 24 minutes, but it's going to require then um, more RAM to be able to simultaneously do lots of channels. And to do the very high resolution data, then uh, it doesn't fit in RAM in any of the machines that I've had access to at least. And so then it has to be kind of split up into lots of different jobs and things written out to disk and so on. And it can take a very long time, but all of that could be optimized if necessary. Can I ask I, a couple yeah. of questions? Um, Absolutely. Do you, so do you think this could be done on the coil combined data as well? Or you know, why do you need to do per coil, essentially? So um, it'd be really interesting to know what the limitation is, but um, you can do it on, you need complex data for it to work. Mm -hmm. And so um, like the demo data that I provide is then um, a virtual coil of all the 32 channels that are joined together with the primary SVD component, I think, so mm -hmm. that it's, um, it's got signal most of the brain, but not, um, not all of it. And so if you want to get the best recon, you probably still need all of the, hmm. um, the complex data. And there is a, a GPU version of the NUFT available um, also on GitHub. But if you wanted to use that, then you probably, I think you need a separate GPU per parallel thread that you're using. And so then and do the CPU acceleration if you're trying to do the GPU acceleration. So then um, uh, all kind of things that might come out in the wash um, eventually with uh, technical uh, implementation issues. Um, I, I'm not sure how much time I'm going to leave for people to do stuff. So I'll just <laughs> ramble on through the rest of my slides and then see if there's anybody who's tried something out and got questions. So. Um, an implementation thing that I think is interesting is that um, with the with accelerated um, MPUH scan, we've got gaps in our K space, and so um, once we've applied Grappa, we actually then fill our K space, but we don't have any motion parameters for the lines which were not acquired. So um, what the toolbox does at the moment is it interpolates motion parameters across K space. And that seems to work quite well for getting some kind of smooth transitions in, in K space. But um, uh, whether that's the, the best thing to do is, is not clear. So, uh, designed for the whole reconstruction pipeline. Um, therefore, that means that it does have Grappa Recon code in it and it can be used with arbitrary kernels and then sampling patterns like KaiP if you wanted. Um, and it's based on a grapper implementation from Brent Young. And um, something else that you can do that's perhaps more interesting to people who don't necessarily have data already for how somebody moved during their scan. So even if they have raw data, they may not have the information of how the person moved. So um, something that you can test even without any data is to simulate what the motion corruption would look like in 2D or 3D um, using the NUF code essentially backwards to simulate the effect a particular motion profile would have on the image quality. And so um, that's one of the demos. So the three demos are the, uh, the NUF, so you can download, like I said, a, a virtual coil of the whole brain, so it's not a very good um, image but it shows it working and you get an idea of how long it takes. Uh, it runs in about 13 seconds on my laptop when I'm not running Zoom, but I tried it the other day on Zoom and it took quite a lot longer, so I maybe won't do that now. Um, and um, 
the demo simulate motion is probably the most interesting one just to try things out if you were curious. So that's where I'd recommend you to start. And then there's FatNav Recon. So if you're interested in uh, reconstructing highly accelerated um, volumes, um, you can see then um, the effect of that. So that's the uh, virtual coil combined one, which has the hole in because of the way the phase ends up adding together across the channels. Um, but that uh, with and without the correction, and it was, it was a real scan where there was not very much motion, but when you try this out on your, on your own, you will be able to see a, a big improvement in the front of the brain. You just have to take my word for it from this. Um, and this is the part which is simulating the motion. So then it's all parameterized in terms of um, whether we have smoother like motion or rough kind of motion and um, how many sudden events there are. So you can see that there are some uh, sudden changes of head position. And then there are some uh, like occur here, which I've put onto the uh, pitch axis and the Z axis that sort of simulate a swallowing type um, motion where somebody might move for um, a few millimeters and then return back to where they were before. And so then these things can be um, played around with to see the effect of that in 3D. Um, and then the FATNAV recon one. So this, this is what the 4 by 4 accelerated data look like if you don't um, uh, run grapper on it. And when you run grapper, then it cleans all of that up nicely because it's a 32 channel coil and very sparse uh, image. So run through all that quite quickly, uh, some acknowledgements here to people, and then um, I guess questions and maybe people can try some things out. I can show on my screen what happens in certain cases and that kind of thing. If there's not enough questions, you'll see. Yeah, one quick question I can ask while sure. we wait. Um, as the case space moves with rotations and translations, um, do you think there's an issue with potential gaps um, that might happen in Absolutely. terms of artifacts? So, um, so what I skipped over there and was wondering about including more detail on is, is essentially the gap problem that um, for small gaps, then it turns out that the um, one application of the NUFT is basically doing a very good job. Um, but as you get bigger gaps, then you may want to use an iterative version of the NUFT to kind of solve the whole recon problem. And um, that then gets obviously computationally much more expensive. And um, there's something that I would like to look more into uh, because um, there, there's some uh, trade-offs there because when I've tried it in a fairly naive manner um, in simulations here, so using that forwards and backwards effect, you can see, oh, well, that's the limit of what I could correct because that hole is too big. And then I try in simulations, the iterative one, and it worked perfectly. But then in on real data, once you have this mismatch between the how the subject really moved versus your estimate of how they moved, then there's a whole other thing that needs to be incorporated into that in the iterative recon for it to converge on the right thing rather than just making it worse. So um, uh, there's there's some interesting work to be done there, basically. But it's quite robust to small holes, basically, like more robust than, um, than my intuition had suggested. Yeah, that makes sense. Do you think that's the main difference between retro and prospective? Uh, that's one of the biggest, yes. Mm. So one would, the other would be latency. But mm. um, in retrospective, then you don't have latency, essentially. You have time points, well, you do have days, but you have time points where you have a pretty good estimate of where the head was, and you then have to work out how to apply that to the time points where you don't have any data, I suppose. And in the, in real time, 
you're always playing catch up in, in that regard, but you don't know where it is at the time of the acquisition that you knew before and so on. Um, but there are definitely head motion patterns where it, for the same 3D scan, but um, the, uh, the real time is better because you're able to fill case space more cleanly. Makes sense. Do we have any extra questions or should we do some hands-on coding? Here's a, yeah, question by Dr. Uh, Stephen Sorbonne. Uh, he asked, uh, would it be hard to generalize to applications outside of the brain, hearts, lung, abdomens, etc.? Um, the short answer is yes. <laughs> it would definitely be hard. Um, the longer answer um, would be very interesting to know to what extent you could use the same concept because here the premise is that the whole volume is rigid. And so then being able to retrospectively correct all the case space together, then um, we're saying that the object translated, so then it just gave us a phase round. Whereas if part of the object translates, then part of the case space has a phase round and part of it doesn't. And, um, they're, and they're superimposed rather than separate parts of case space. Um, and so there are advanced things that you can do by like making assumptions of multiple rigid parts. Um, but I haven't looked into um, the limitations of those kinds of models. So. Thank you. And there is another question by Dr. Stella Carpore. Uh, do you envision an extension to radial sampling of case space in the future? Radial sampling should be inherently more robust to motion than partition sampling, but it, it would be nice to have a toolbox modeling uh, the artifacts due to the motion. Um, so the, the toolbox can be adapted for radial if you want it, it will not I'm not going to say how long it would take me, I don't know, but uh, basically it's just the code is there, but you would have to match the parameters and the inputs and so on. Um, but uh, radial is definitely very interesting. So there is a, a, the um, uh, Stephen Texcometti's work looking at um, uh, MPN rage, I think he calls it, um, where it's 3D uh, radial MP rake. And then you have all kinds of different options for your time window for how much, how many radial components you are using to make your virtual navigator and so on for the reconstruction. And he gets very good results. Um, my impression is that for resolutions of around a millimeter, then radial is probably the way to go in terms of the most robust sequence. But as you try and go to higher resolution, um, especially if it's full 3D radial, it's very inefficient in terms of case space coverage because you're going through the center all the time and not visiting the edges enough, which you need for that resolution. And you're, when you increase your spatial resolution, you're just adding edges. And, and if you're not sampling those, um, you would struggle to get um, more detail in the final image, I believe, but I haven't had the chance to test where the, uh, the limit is to that um, assumption. So, um, if no other questions right away, then I, I can just see uh, whether this live demo bit then works. If I just share the, uh, the whole of the screen, because otherwise you won't see the screen. So that screen there. 
Um, um, so, so I've got MATLAB open and, and it's just testing that these three demo things were running. And so if we go to the simulate uh, motion one, I don't know how small this ends up being on your screens, um, but hopefully you can see it approximately. Um, this is reasonably well documented from some time ago when I set up the, the demo. Um, and obviously you need then some brain which you're using as your uh, template, which you're going to corrupt with some motion profiles. And so I used the, um, the Colin 27 brain uh, with a link to where you could get that from. But obviously you could use any 3D data set you want essentially. And so then um, it, these are the parameters then for how to um, parameterize motion. And so I use the kind of, uh, something like the Perlin noise. I um, haven't looked enough detail into exactly what the definition of Perlin noise is and so on, but um, by adding in harmonics at different powers at different relative uh, frequencies, then we can have um, essentially, this is what I've called the, the smoother motion. And if we go for quite rough motion, um, then we get something, a second, there we go. So this is then a rougher uh, motion profile. And then, then we get to the, the really rough motion. And basically this is the one that gives terrible results from the, um, both from the corrupted image and then the correction just looks awful anyway as well. And so um, I suppose in terms of getting the best image quality, then we want to try to avoid in the first place that people ever move like this. And so then um, different ways of cushioning the head can become important and, and that kind of thing. Um, and so then um, just some parameters for how often you swallow and how big your swallow is and so on. I'll put them there, and then we can simulate the effect of that motion. And, um, and so this will actually also doesn't output it at the moment as a figure, but um, it simulates how big the gaps are then in the case space. And so then that can um, be um, interesting in itself. And so I've got like an undergraduate project at the moment that's doing the 2D version of the simulation and then trying to look at different image metrics for um, quality in a known controlled um, uh, disruption of the image based on different scalable um, motion profiles. So then to understand which motion profiles are the worst and which image metrics are the best reflection of how the image quality is deteriorating. So then um, we get a 3D volume that we can click through in, in that directly. It's a frame. And then this is the simulated uh, motion corruption based on the profile. And then the, the second part would simulate how well could that be corrected by, um, by a retrospective technique as well. The questions that this has brought up. If not, I guess that's the the end of the session anyway. So it's not too bad time. Uh -huh. Yeah. Thank you so much, Daniel. Thank you everyone for attending this session.